He served as chief counsel to Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, former general counsel for the National Republican Senatorial Committee, and he is in Northern Virginia. Alex, it now appears Republicans have the votes to confirm your reaction to this. Uh, I'm not surprised that uh, Leader McConnell was able to get the votes together. I'm a little surprised at the speed at which he was able to get the votes together. Uh, we're only a couple of days into this, and already, uh, generally, uh, people are conceding uh, that Leader McConnell has the votes to go ahead and move this nomination. And Trump apparently is set to announce the nominee on Saturday. And do you think if that does that, do you think they can get a confirmation before November 3rd? It, it is certainly possible. Uh, the reality is that once we started uh, chipping away at the filibuster with all the various nuclear option permutations going back uh, in the last 15 or so years, uh, a lot of those roadblocks simply went away. There are certainly some procedural games that can be played. Uh, the Senate is is not designed under the best of uh, circumstances, uh, but uh, I think a, a vote and confirmation by election day is definitely possible. What do you make of the hypocrisy of those senators saying when the last time when Obama lost, when Scalia died, no, let's wait, let's wait till the election, it was nine months away and now they rush this through. You don't see any yeah, hypocrisy well, there? I I don't because I actually read what Leader McConnell said back then, and I read what he said as recently as this February before this uh, this vacancy came up, and he was very clear both times uh, that he was talking about situations where it was an election year and the Senate was held by the other party from the president. Um, it is not terribly shocking that the other party is not enthusiastic about moving someone else's nominees with all deliberate speed. Uh, that's different than a president and Senate of the same party. There have been numerous, I think it's 29 vacants that have come up in election years. Uh, the vast majority of those have gone through. I understand uh, the, the concern. Uh, I, I think a lot of the, the issues that have plagued Supreme Court nominations uh, in particular, what happened with uh, Justice Kavanaugh uh, play into this dynamic and are unfortunate. Uh, but doesn't the senator from South Carolina appear particularly hypocritical when he says, record these words? There, there's no doubt that there are people on both sides of this issue uh, who spoke out last time during the Merrill Britt Garland conversation uh, who are going to have their words thrown back at them. Uh, certainly, Lindsey Graham uh, is dealing with some of that. Uh, Barack Obama, uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, a number of people who made comments at that point are going to, to have to, to hear those again. The reality is the focus rightly, uh, once a nominee is announced and that process starts, that process should really focus not on what was said uh, back then, but on the merits of this nominee uh, and filling that vacancy. Uh, this could lead to other things. This could lead to a Democratic president, a Democratic Senate, and the Senate votes to increase the Supreme Court to 12. They can do that. Uh, one of the things that we've heard uh, is talk about court packing. Uh, it was a really bad idea the last time that it was tried. Uh, it's a bad idea now. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, when people talk historically about the great presidency uh, of FDR, um, the one mark that they always bring up was the attempted court packing plan. Uh, I think uh, what kind of an idea this is. I don't care who's in power. Um, uh, the, uh, changing the structure of the court to achieve uh, a short-term partisan aim is a very bad idea. Does the court lead the nation or follow the nation? Now, this nation agrees with Roe versus Wade. They certainly agreed with the, with the Health Act. And so if you have a court that's out of whack with the country, what comes first? Well, the country comes first, and I don't think that's really a question with the court. Uh, in terms of following, I think the real question is, does the court follow the Constitution? Uh, the court is not supposed to be 
uh, a political body bending to the uh, the popular whims of the people, uh, just as the Senate is designed to put a little distance in between the people and their representatives compared to the House, uh, the Supreme Court, all courts, uh, are at least theoretically supposed to be a step further than that. Again, their mission is not to follow popular opinion. Their mission is to follow the Constitution of the United States and interpret um, whether they are laws that are passed or other regulatory events in line with those rights and privileges uh, assured by the Constitution. All right, suppose the election is held and Biden wins and the Democrats win the Senate. Should McConnell ask for the approval of the new justice in a lame duck session? Absolutely. Uh, the fact that it's a lame duck uh, is reflective of the calendar uh, and the fact that some of these folks will be uh, departing shortly. They don't lose their power uh, to, uh, to finish their constitutionally uh, authorized and, and mandated acts. Um, I do think if this vacancy had occurred after the election uh, and the other party had won, uh, I don't see uh, a lot of scenarios whereby a nominee could get through, start to finish in the lame duck, but we're not in the lame duck. Uh, it's September. The election's not until November. Uh, the timeline works fine uh, for processing this nomination uh, via regular order. Do you see any downside for Republicans if they go ahead with filling this seat? There are certainly those who uh, have pointed to uh, things like uh, Justice Ginsburg's uh, apparent last wishes to be the uh, Democrat appoint her replacement. Um, I, I, with all due respect, um, her last wishes uh, are not the driver for this conversation, nor are any justices' wishes about uh, what should happen vis-a-vis -vis their seat uh, relevant to the process. I think the, the larger risk, frankly, uh, imagine a scenario where President Trump waited uh, to appoint someone and then didn't win uh, and then didn't have that opportunity to fill the seat. Um, I, look, obviously, uh, the fates decide when these vacancies become available, not politics. Um, and, and these are the cards that have been dealt. Uh, given the extremely uh, high tension right now because we're about to have a presidential election, it's certainly more dramatic and some of that has ramped up. Uh, but I really don't think the president uh, and the members of the Senate have a choice uh, but to proceed to fill the vacancy. All right, his, uh, we don't know the name. It looks like Amy Barrett. Is that what you hear? I, I have certainly heard her name uh, a lot. There are others that I've heard on that short list, but uh, uh, all indications are that uh, I've seen it may be a short list of one at this point. Trump says he needs nine justices to be seated so they can rule on things like mail-in ballots. Is that a pretty, <laughs> isn't that a slight reason well, we, we need nine justices because there's supposed to be nine justices in the court. Uh, whether or not they're going to hear cases involving mail-in ballots or anything related to the election is really irrelevant. Uh, I'm sure that's top of mind for President Trump uh, when he uh, thinks about potential court cases. Uh, but the reality is uh, we need nine justices uh, to resolve all these issues, not just those that might relate to the election. All right, Alex, go, let's go to other places. How does the election look to you? I, th I think it's very tight. Uh, I think the tightening that started in July and went through the conventions has only continued. Um, I saw some polling today uh, that President Trump, for the first time uh, in recent polling history, is affirmatively ahead. A lot of the swing states are a lot closer uh, than the Biden campaign would like. Um, Pennsylvania comes to mind, uh, Vice President Biden, Scranton Joe's uh, uh, partial home state uh, is pretty close. I, I think we are going to be up very late on election night and beyond. I also think uh, just like this nomination has thrown the political world uh, asunder, I think there is ample time in the next 40 plus days for more surprises. And if 2020 has taught us anything, uh, is that there will be lots more. Do you fear, as many do on both sides, upheaval on Election Day, that we won't have a result that day? I, I am concerned about uh, a clear result. Uh, 
I was involved in the 2000 recount um, a process in Florida, and one of the really unfortunate consequences of that was a fairly traumatic uh, break the American people had uh, where they began to distrust a lot of the mechanics of our democracy. Uh, and while uh, I'm not adverse to staying up uh, as late as I need to, and if some of these states go into uh, after hours, so to speak, so be it. Um, I think the American uh, public is patient in that regard, but a protracted, uh, even a couple of days legal fight uh, that determines the outcome of the election, uh, I would not be ideal and I think may do further damage uh, to our confidence. Alex, thanks for your time today as always. Thanks, Larry. Enjoyed it.